I'm taking you to the Black Museum at Scotland Yard. The Black Museum. Isn't this a name for a room which holds a series of murder exhibits? Not always frightening in themselves, but terrifying when considered in their relation to their history. Now, uh, what have we here? A human finger preserved in alcohol. A blood-stained matchstick. A piece of carbon paper. A railway ticket. A can opener. Each a piece of evidence in a horrifying crime. Over there now, uh, to the left, in the place reserved for the newest exhibit, is a piece of paper. Reposing on it is a small bit of bone. I'm not an anatomist, but uh, I know that that small bone was once part of a human voice box. Just a little piece of bone. You could break it with two fingers, but it was strong enough to hang a man. Bombs falling, buildings burning, the city near chaos. Now, uh, supposing you murdered somebody during the Blitz on London. A woman. And supposing you'd buried the body in the cellar of a Blitz building. Under a lot of debris. And then you'd laid a trail which showed that the woman, like thousands of others at the time, had left London. And this was all accepted. And supposing a year passed, and then more than a year, and everything was forgotten. You'd be feeling pretty safe, wouldn't you? And supposing you knew that you'd put lime with the body and that by now it's only a heap of bones under a lot of rubbish in a bombed building with no means of identification, you'd begin to think that things were, so to speak, all clear, wouldn't you? Or would you? It is July 1942. The blitz is over. A gang of demolition workers are tearing rubble away in the cellar of a damaged Baptist chapel. Sure, what's that, Bill? What's that? Looks like a skeleton. No, I thought it can. Look, there's a skull. All right, my top it. Not the button when the bone fell. Here, you better tell the folk. Mine! 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 Come down here. And that's how it began. Now, for research purposes, every bomb victim was subjected to a careful medical examination. The cause of each death had to be determined. That's uh, just to make sure they were all accountable to Adolf Hitler. And, of course, medical facts are frequently a means of establishing identity where there's little else to go on. The pathologist examined the remains and reported to the coroner. There isn't much to go on. It's the remains of a woman, of course, and there's been some burning. And considering the place of burial of fellow was fairly dry earth, I'd say she must have died about a year or 18 months ago. That would be during the air raid. Yes. With your permission, I'll have the remains moved to a hospital laboratory. Maybe my equipment there will bring the facts to light. Very well, Doctor. The uh, incomplete remains were removed to the Department of Forensic Medicine at Guy's Hospital, where a detailed examination showed that a tiny bone in what was left of the larynx had been fractured. Just a tiny bone. The pathologist made his first report to Superintendent Rawlings of the Big Five of Scotland Yard. Let's uh, listen as Rawlings did to that report, for we are Rawlings, you and I inside the brains of Scotland Yard. It's an apparently trivial little fracture, but it's one of the most significant in forensic medicine. All I can say at the moment is this woman may have met her death in a raid, or she may have met her death by strangulation, manual strangulation. I favor the latter view. Is there any evidence of identity, Doc? Anything we can start work on? Well, there are a few details I can give you now. It's the body of a woman aged between 40 and 50. Height, five feet, or five feet one inch. The lower jaw's missing, but in the upper jaw, she's won a dental plate. There's no trace of it, but it probably contains seven false teeth. Four remaining teeth have fillings. Oh, and one last point. On the back of the skull, I also found adhering to it a few strands of hair. I'd say her hair was dark brown, going grey. I'm sorry I can't be more helpful at the moment. Well, it's something to go on, Doc. A woman, aged between 40 and 50, about five feet tall, going grey. Somewhere in London, there is thousands of evacuees. 
its shifting population, its blitz victims, one woman had to be identified. A woman whose description fitted thousands of others. A woman who had gone missing. Check the missing person's register. There's several in the registry like that, sir. Yeah, let me see. Yes. 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 This looks like it might fit. Age 47, height 5 feet 1 inch. Hair dark brown, going gray brown. Reported missing Good Friday, 1941. And, uh, 15 months ago. Reported missing by her sister. That description fits, sir? Yes. Yeah. Age in a thousand other people. You see, age, height, and color of hair aren't enough. For instance, did this woman have a dental plate? And the upper plate with seven teeth in it. Is she still missing? Is she still alive? Easy. I think the sister, sir. The woman is still missing. She went missing on Good Friday, as reported, and hasn't been seen or heard of since. Her sister says she had a dental plate, an upper plate. With seven teeth? She didn't know how many, sir. Who was a dentist? Oh, she moved around a bit, sir. Uh, the address of the three dentists. I'll see the dentist and ask if they could identify the fillings in her teeth. Uh, yes, sir. 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 You've got a long way to go. A very long way. Yes, there was a long way to go. But all over London, detectives were drumming for information. All over Britain, other missing women were being traced. A photograph was obtained. Then came another clue. It wasn't important, but it was interesting. The sort of the storybook clue that detectives keep them on their toes. Uh, this woman on the missing person's register, sir. Mrs. Dobkin, you mean? Uh, yes, sir. A few days after she went missing, a handbag was found in the post office at Guildford. Guildford? Was it ever claimed? No, sir. What was in it? I have a report on it, sir. It contained a ration book, identity card, two return halves for local London travel, nothing for a journey to Guildford. A ration book and identity card. She couldn't have gone a day without them in wartime England. Yet they'd been unclaimed for 15 months. That could mean that she had no need of them anymore, which could also mean that she was dead. Of course, she could have taken a single ticket to Stafford. If so, you could reason that she was going to stay there for a while. But if she was going to stay there for a while, why didn't she search for a lost handbag? She still had needed them, the ration book and the identity card. Perhaps it was just a quick visit on a return ticket. If so, why wasn't the return half also in the lost handbag? She kept other return halves there. Or did someone else take that handbag to Guilford to plant it there? give the impression that she'd moved to that district. Let's suppose that this Mrs. Dobkin is the same woman that we are trying to identify, and that at this time she was dead in a bombed chapel in London. How did her handbag get to Guildford? Who took it there, and why? If someone took that handbag to Guildford after she was dead, then the doctor's supposition is right. She was not an air raid victim. She was murdered. But is it the same woman? It's uh, this kind of teasing, unanswered clue that keeps detectives hot on the trail. Inquiring, questioning, interviewing. The people who lived around the bomb chapel were asked to perform that difficult feat of thinking back 15 months. Yes, I think I remember. They had a fire under the chapel about that time. Yes, it's after the bomb. They called the NSA. Yes, we attended that fire. There's a report in the incident book. A fire watcher said he saw some smoke coming from a floorboard from a little school next to the chapel. He said he threw some water on it, but it got out of hand. Did the fire watcher call you? No, it was a police call. The fire had been burning about two hours before we were called. Did the fire watcher say why he failed to report it? He made no explanation to me. I see. I inspected the cellar after the fire, and I felt that the fire had been caused by someone on the premises. There was no raid that night, and there was never anything in front of what left in the cellar. Yet that night, a straw hat was there, torn open, and part of it had been set alight. I questioned the fire watcher, but he was so his basis, he annoyed that. I made a note of it in my diary. Why don't you ask the bloke what used to fire watch over there? Next door to the chapel. He can tell you about it. He was a bloke named Dobkin. He was a bloke named Dobkin. The same name as a woman whose handbag was found at Guildford. He was her husband. A woman goes missing. Her husband is a fire watcher. A woman's body is found buried in a bomb damaged cellar next to a fire washing post. The body is partly burnt. He's implicated in the fire at that same spot. Well, to the lay mind, that seems fairly conclusive evidence. At least it's uh, very suspicious. But the 
dead woman has not been identified as his wife. In fact, the remains are almost unidentifiable. Vaguely like his wife, yes, but supposing his wife is still alive. Of course, he was questioned. Yes, that's right, sir. I remember that good Friday. That's the last time I saw her. You've been living apart and she tried to make up to me. I wasn't going back to it, though. I couldn't stand it. We had tea together in Dawson, talked it over, and then she got on the bus going towards Shoreditch. And that's the last I saw of her. You made a written statement, sir. Shall I read it? Yes, go on. It reads, Div Divisional Inspector. Dear sir, in respect of what you say that my wife has been found dead or murdered... Who says that his wife has been found oh, murdered? No one, sir. He wrote that himself. I see. Well, let's have another talk to the medical boys and get that sentence. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, doctor. Good evening. You want to see me? Yes. By the way, thank you for that sketch of the upper jaw. It's identical to the upper jaw of the dead woman. Do you think you could identify your... Yes. Uh, it on the table. I recognized it the moment I came into the laboratory. You've no doubt. None at all. And those are my fillings and teeth. I'd recognize my own work anywhere. That is the jaw. These are the teeth of the patient you knew as Mrs. Dobkin. Positively. And do you recognize this? Yes. That is a photograph of my patient, Mrs. Dobkin. Yes. So the missing woman and the dead woman are the same person. Some uh, final questions had to be gone over. Why had the missing woman been found dead near her husband's fire washing post? Had he induced her to go? He said she'd never been there. Why was there a fire in the cellar? The fire in which the husband was involved. Why had he, a fire watcher, failed to raise the alarm? Was it because he started the fire to burn the body? Why does he deny knowledge of the cellar? when he had been seen going there. Why did he return to his old fire washing post? And why does he deny he'd ever gone back? Is the answer to every question the same? That he'd murdered his wife? Yes. I think Mr. Tomkin had better be brought in. So far, the work of Scotland Yard had been to identify and prove in their own mind that they knew the murderer. Their next job was to find him. For Mr. Dobkin had disappeared. As you've learned, the Scotland Yard first identified the murderer in their own minds there remained no shadow of doubt that Dobkin was the guilty man. But, as is so often the case with the Yard, in making sure that the man was guilty before taking him into custody, they'd given him an opportunity of realizing that the police were after him. Within half an hour, Rawlings giving orders for Dobkin's arrest, the first report came in. Dobkin left the lodging house where he was staying two days ago without giving an address. They have no information on him at the food office, and he just didn't turn up at the factory where he was working. Any relatives? Oh, my sister at Clapper. She told us a funny thing. Dobkin was always in court for failing to pay his wife her maintenance money. In fact, he went to jail for it once, but directly she disappeared, he became very regular in his payments. Mm, something else for Mr. Dobkin to explain. The police looked at his dossier. Age 49, born in Tappan, spent all his life in London. If Mr. Dobkin ran true to firm, he'd be found somewhere in London. The dragnet went out. He's sitting, drinking a cup of coffee in a little Italian restaurant at the back of Piccadilly Circus. He's thinking. Mr. Dobkin's mentality is limited, but in its right, furtive way, it's sizing up the problems and planning for the future. I wonder if they're looking for me yet. I suspect they are. They're only venturing me and Harry. I wonder if they've got a picture of me. I suppose I better do something about changing the appearance. Them's are doing soon. Start wearing a cap or something. I know. I'm going to shave and take my moustache off. That'll make a difference. That'll fool them. Oh, I'd better get out of this place. Too many crops around. You never know. One of them might stop you. They suddenly might come up behind you and say, This chair taken. Eh? Oh, no. Time to be comfortable. You don't mind the place, Mr. Vinay, do you, sir? What, eh? Oh, no, no. That's all right. I mustn't get nervous. They won't recognize me. 
Anyway, I've got that other identity card. It's worth a couple of quid, too. Left it on me while it would be awful if I lost that. It's all right as long as you've got money. Fifty quid will last me a bit. By the time that's gone, maybe it'll be safe to get a job. Then I'll have to get a ration book and write it to your uncle. Take it slowly, that's your idea. Just lie low for the moment. Don't try to do anything silly. Keep out of people's way. Keep your mouth shut. Keep moving. Be careful. Just one slip and perhaps you'd get a glance at the paper. There's rather an interesting murder case. Most ingenious. Hmm. Oh, oh, thanks. Have reason to suspect. Warren has been issued. Charles Dobkin. An arrest is anticipated during the next few hours. engaged in tracking down a particularly important lawbreaker is known as Operation Let, the code word title for the system of suddenly throwing a police net around the area in which they believe their man to be hiding and asking every person within a narrowing circle to produce proof of identification. In this case, Superintendent Rawlings was pretty sure that his man was within a square mile of Piccadilly Circuit. So it was late that night this radio message went out from the information room at Scotland Yard. Radio operator MG2W calling all cars... MG2W calling all cars. Operation Net. Patrols assigned to C Division area to move into position one minute from now. Over. In the operations room, Superintendent Rawlings was giving final instructions to the foot feet. That evening, we propose to cordon up the Piccadilly Circus area in accordance with this plan. Motor car patrols are already in position at Piccadilly and Elton Mile Street, and so on, right, right, right the way round. Your zero hour is half past ten. At that time, cordons will be thrown across here, 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 and so on. I don't mind telling you, I've more than suspicion that we'll pick up our man, Dobkin, this evening, but the capture of Dobkin isn't the only purpose of this operation. We've had a few identity card checkups, but this, I think, is one of the biggest roundups we've attempted. So, incidentally... The military police have all received parallel instructions and will be working with you in a normal manner. Right then, good luck until 10.30. Motor car patrols, cordons, one of the biggest rounds up Scotland Yard has ever attempted. It's a good thing for Mr. Dobkin's already overstrained peace of mind that he doesn't realize what the odds are against him. He'd be wishing he was the invisible man. Zero hour, 10.30 p.m. Now, slowly does it. One of it, all right. You first, Miss. May I see your identity card? Yes, and you are. Been doing anybody in lately, Buck? Not me. Okay, pass along. Charger. Here you are. Ah, war reserve constable, eh? Why the heck aren't you on duty tonight? Good, not me ever. I've got to have one evening off, you know. Yes, that's what they all say, chum. Now then, pass along. Card check. There you are, Constable. John Rankin. Hey, wait a minute. I recognize you. You're the man. Here, get out of my way. Here, I... Hey, hey, wait a minute, chum. Here you are. I've done this card. You've left it behind. What's that with him? I don't know. I was only going to tell him I'd seen him earlier today. There's something up with him, huh? Yes, 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 I think he's a clap of the Oh, he's going to need that later. What do you mean? Well, Mrs. Bolt is the wrong way. This time, he's the wrong side of the police. And he left this identity card in my hands. John Rankin. Yes, it's a portrait, all right. This is one of the cards which were pinched about four weeks ago. He picked up several of them. They are all blanks when they were stolen. Wait a minute. Have we a specimen of Dobkin's writing? Yes, I have several specimen signatures. All his papers are in this corner. Let's have a look at one of them. See you, Arthur. Very careless of Mr. Rankin. He was our sergeant. He signed his name just like Mr. Dobkin. Quite a coincidence. And so the night's work went on. Slowly the crowds within the police court and diminished. Fewer and fewer people were left within the net that covered Piccadilly Circus. And as the crowds became less, the police became all the more careful. Mr. Dobkin's chances were getting smaller. Get rattled. I see hundreds of people. I've got to wait in the tomb, that's all. They can't keep on chicken all night. They'll have to pack up sooner or later, then they'll go right. 
All I have to do is wait. All right, sir. Pass along. Next one, please. Identity card. Thank you. Sergeant. Yes, sir. I think he'll start moving his cordon there at the beginning of his circle. Head him in gradually, all the way around. Then when we're close enough, we'll do a sweep right across. Very good. Have a long seat. Make way there. Up front. Uh, Mr. Dobkin had been a trifle optimistic. The police may be slow, but they are thorough. Slowly down Piccadilly, down Regent Street, all the other three acting and finally meeting at Piccadilly Circus. The police cordon started to move. They were slowly, inexorably closing in. But there was one possible way out. Mr. Dobkin decided to take a chance. Good old underground railway. Why did nothing get that before? They'll be walking it, of course, but if I make a run for it. Well, they'll have to be pretty slippy. I'm going to do it. 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 It's not a bad simile for Piccadilly Circus Underground Station. The largest subway station in the world is rather like a rabbit one. Clouds of existence. All four converging lines meeting deep below zero. Dobkin pushes his way through the cutting hall, buys his ticket, takes his place on the escalator, going down towards the Waterloo line. He doesn't know it, but 20 yards behind him, fighting his way through the crowd, trying to keep up with him, is the one person in the world Mr. Dobkin doesn't want to meet. A gentleman from Scotland Yard. That fooled him. But it's not enough. Last time I'm coming up to the West End, though. It's a quiet suburban life for me from now on. Full of blue light for Waterloo, eh? Some second sense seems to have warned Dobkin that something was wrong. As the crowd in out in the passage leading to the platform, he began to a run. He reached the platform as the train arrived. It was almost the last southbound train of the night, and there was a crowd round the doorway. Mr. Dobkin pushed and shoved. And with a final heave, he was in. Scotland Yard is not without its resources in an emergency. Jail and cross, old time. What do you mean, old time? Come on, big laddie. Old time. But this train goes under what alone. I know what it is. The train goes under the Thames and they've closed the floodgates. Four of the government is now running on. Just in case a bomb gets the tunnel under the river. That's just that's what it is. But an air raid alarm isn't the portal? I don't know. I just have my instructions. That's all. Come on now. Move along, please. It's no good you're waiting on the platform. This is the last train. You can get a bus no. upstairs if you want. I can't understand it. What are they up to? No sense oh, at all. Oh, hurry up, John. Identity card. Uh, Identity card, please. Yeah. Take one, please. Identity card. I haven't got one. My name is... has come home. The direct means for King Cross is only a very short and rather charming walk along the embankment to Scotland Yard. But Mr. Dobkin absolutely admitted that his most embarrassing moments were not at the height of the investigation or in the heat of the final chase. They were before the discovery of his wife's remains. You remember that he became strangely regular in paying his wife's maintenance money in court after her disappearance. You see, one of the officials of Old Street Police Station had developed a trying habit of remarking to him when he brought in the money. Now, Harry, you know you killed your old woman. What have you done with the body? Well, that's all today. I'll be back again to tell you some more of the secrets of Scotland Yard. Well.